Matthew 6. This is God's word from verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. As far the reading of God's word, may the Lord be pleased to add his blessing. Let's pray. O oh Lord, all of us are like grass. And you know, in our glory, in the best glory we can put forth, all of us are like the flowers of the field. The grass does wither. The flowers fall. But your word does abide forever. It is your word, O Lord, that we now seek to focus on. We kindly pray for your blessing, both in the seats and here in the pulpit, that in the preaching and in the hearing of your word, your Holy Spirit would be present to strengthen us, to create in us eyes that see and ears that hear. We please pray these things for your glory. We pray them. Relying on the merits of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as we focus on verse 24, I will be asking the question, are you trying to serve God and money? The Lord has said in verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for he will either pay, he will for either he will hate the one and love the, the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And he makes this conclusion, you cannot serve God and man. Before we go into that, let's recap. For the sake of remembering where we've come from, and for the sake of those who have not been here in the last two afternoons when I have preached, uh, the 
two sermons that we started with, looking at verse 19. And there we saw commands on storing up treasures given by the Lord. Two commands. The first command was, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth with the force of stop laying up for yourselves treasures on earth. And the positive side, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And we saw that this is not a command not to lay up. It is a command to actually lay up, but to lay up treasures in the proper place. We did see that you are not laying up for posterity, you are laying up for yourself. This, we saw, is a serious thing. You cannot goof on this and then assume that those who will suffer are those who will come after you. Whatever you are laying up is for yourself. We saw the commands and they were clear. And then the Lord condescends and gives us a convincing set of reasons on why we should not lay up treasures on earth, but we should lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He first of all makes common observations on earthly and heavenly treasures, available to all who would see that treasures on earth are subject to being attacked by passive and active enemies. The moth and the rust will prey upon earthly treasures and will destroy them. The thieves will fraudulently or forcefully break in and steal earthly treasures. On the other hand, treasures in heaven are safe. Neither moth nor rust destroys them. Neither thieves, and thieves are neither able to break in or steal uh, treasures that you store up in heaven. And so we were told it is common sense. Lay up, it's a common issue observable that earthly treasures will either lose their value or they will be taken away from you, or you will be taken away from them. Lay up your treasures in heaven. And then we were also given a helpful connector that should challenge us, that should convince us as a very strong reason not to lay up our treasures on earth, but to lay them up in heaven. In verse 21, we were told, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we said that where you store your treasures will have the impact of revealing your heart to us. We will be able to see your actions and you will be able to see your actions. And by your actions, touching on treasures, they'll reveal to you whether your heart is in heaven or whether your heart is on this passing earth. But we also did see that what you do with treasures does not only reveal who you are, but it restricts your heart. It focuses your heart into that place where you are storing. We also did look last Sunday at verse 22 and verse 23. And we were told by the Lord that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, if your eye is sound, if your eye is focused, if your eye is single, if your eye healthy could also mean generous. If your eye is generous, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if you have an eye that is looking up and down at the same time, an impossible feat, then your whole body will be full of darkness. Then we saw this very solemn thing that the Lord adds here as an exclamative. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? 
if you are in the vast oceans, trying to make it to the shores, and you have a compass that says south is north and north is east, you are in a terrible situation. And those whose eyes are bad, who bow down before earthly treasures, and that bowing down is demonstrated through stinginess, covetousness, idolatry, and they think that because they are accumulating here on earth, they are okay, are sadly in scary darkness. The Lord wants us there. So today we come to verse 24. And having seen the command to store up our treasures in heaven, having graciously been given a convincing set of reasons, today the Lord makes a clarification that demands a choice. A choice demanding clarification is made by the Lord in verse 24. It demands that you make the decision to either serve God or money. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Many people, quietly in their hearts, doubt this statement. It seems inappropriate. They wonder quietly and some loudly wonder why God and what is being described here as serving money cannot coexist. Why must I choose between serving God and serving money, they wonder. And before maybe we look deeply into what the Lord is saying here, perhaps it would be important to see what the Lord is not saying. The Lord is not saying that if you're wealthy, you cannot serve Him. That is not what He's saying. Money itself is not the problem that is being identified here. The problem, as we will see, is one of divided loyalties. What we need to understand is what does it mean to serve? What does it mean to be master? What is servanthood? What is slavery, which is what is in view there? Divided loyalties will be the inevitable result of pursuing money. And First Timothy 6.10 warns us that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith, and they have pierced themselves with many pangs. Dear friends, we live in a culture that is rife with materialism. Greed is good is one of our celebrated maxims in today's society. Our society seems to celebrate and encourage those who speak about their pursuit of money with remarkable candor. If you are comsi comsa about whether you are pursuing money or not, society doesn't celebrate. But if you are candid about the fact that you will get rich or die trying, then society seems to platform you. In fact, when many people want to inquire about another person's wealth, they ask the question, how much is he worth? It's a sieve, worth and net assets are the same thing. 
but are they? What people are willing to do for money is very scary. Many years ago, I remember reading an excerpt from In the Day Americans Told the Truth. And the authors, The Day Americans Told the Truth, shared some things that people are willing to do for $10 million, 1 billion shillings. 25% would be willing to abandon their families. 23% would be willing to be prostitutes for more than a week. 6% of the Americans polled at the time were willing to give up their American citizenship. 16% were willing to leave their spouse. 10% would be willing to withhold crucial testimony that would let a murderer go free. 7% would kill a stranger for 1 billion shillings. 3% would be willing to do away with their children. The statistics could be worse here. The Lord taught more about wealth. He taught more about this subject matter than any other social issue, more than marriage, more than politics, more than work, more than sexual relations, or more than power. His teaching about money stands in a discussion about here, in a discussion about lo loyalty to God. And it's very sobering, friends, when we think about who's who are the primary audience here? The primary audience of the Lord here in the Sermon of the Mountain is, is not a group of Deca millionaires from the local Jewish golf club. He was speaking to a group of people who are largely peasants. And this should cause us to stop snoozing out because our temptation when we hear subjects like this is to mentally switch off. Think that loyalty to God versus loyalty to money is not an issue that I battle with. We don't think many times that we are affected by greed. In fact, we hear such a topic and we are happy that so-and-so is present this morning to hear this psalm. We pray for them, that the preacher would make his points clear to them. We rarely if ever hear in private counseling of people who come for help because they are struggling with greed. The Lord's primary audience is made up of people who are like us, whose minds may have been occupied with issues of money during the dominant chunk of their waking hours. And that, therefore, requires that we sit up and listen to the Lord when in verse 24 he says, no one can serve two masters. There are many who try to serve two masters. They honor God on Sunday if it is convenient. They serve mammon. They serve money on Monday to Friday. They reserve Saturday to themselves. This is a very common mindset. This mindset regards faith as a hobby, some pastime activity like gardening or bird watching. This kind of thinking wonders, surely, can't a person have a job and a hobby or two? And the answer is yes, you can have a job and more than one hobby. But I have a question. Is faith a hobby? 
My friend, faith is not a hobby. It is not a pastime activity. Perhaps they read, no one can serve two masters. And what comes to their mind is they view God as an employer rather than a master. And such people would wonder, surely a person can work for two employers if he or she has time? And the answer is yes, you can work for two or even hold down three jobs at the same time if you have time. But is that what is in view here? And God is talking about masters. What is in view here, dear friend, is not employment, but being owned. No one can be owned. No one can belong to two masters. Serve here has to do with slavery. A slave is one who belongs wholly and is entirely under the command of his master. Master here, Kyrios, is not merely employer. The force of the word master here is owner, lord, one who owns and one who controls property. And in this case, the property is a servant or the slave. Again, I reiterate the words of the Lord. No one can serve two masters. No one can belong to two masters. No slave can be the property of two owners. Single ownership and full-time service are irreducible minimums to slavery. Without these two essential things, slavery will not exist. A master can, by definition, demand service at any time. You cannot serve two masters, and especially two masters who, in this case, are diametrically opposed. The word other, as it is used here, does not mean other of the same kind. It is not a quantitative term. It is a qualitative term. It is not like Matthew 5.39, turn the other cheek. It is a cheek, but the other cheek. Other, as it is used here, would be maybe best painted by, they spoke with other tongues, different tongues. That is what is in view here. The Lord presents a clarification that makes a very important choice that demands, rather, a very important choice to be made by each one of us. This choice touches on treasures, as we see at the end of the verse, you cannot serve God and money. And it is in this context where you have been asked already, will you store treasure on earth or in heaven? This statement is made in the context where you have already been asked, will your eyes be light or will your eyes be dark? And as we have read there in John chapter 3, verse 19, and this is the judgment, Brother Ebenezer in the public reading of Scripture read for us, John 3, 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The judgment is not that people did not see the light. The judgment is, and people loved darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. The question for us is, will we love darkness or will we love light? We are also being asked now, will you serve God or will you serve money? This question is for all of us, whether you are rich or poor. This question speaks to all of us with equal force. Both the rich and the poor can look to wealth 
for security, can look to wealth for happiness. Every one of us is susceptible to the wide continent of very silly and sinful actions that are fueled by greed, covetousness, and idolatry. Maybe you still have a pushback against what I'm saying. You're saying, Eric, about 80% of my waking up hours are spent at work. And when I'm there, I'm thinking about making money and saving money. I almost do nothing, Eric, that does not have financial ramifications on me or someone else. I'm feeling confused because I'm continuously flooded with opportunities, with options, and with appeals on how to either spend money or get money. I feel harassed by the guilt that continuously pursues me because of my past errors or sins concerning this subject of money. Maybe you are there saying, Eric, the teaching of these verses seem to carry with them the danger of failing to be real, failing to be alive to what is requisite for this life. And maybe as a result you feel destitute as you look at these verses, as you look at their absolute nature, their black and white nature. There is no demilitarized zone in this verse. The force is very absolute. There is no room for fence sitting here. And you feel scared. If this is your struggle, if you, this is your concern, let me encourage you that the Lord speaks to you in the next section that we will hopefully look at between Matthew in Matthew 6, 25 to 34, and he will give you a solid bedrock to stand on when the temptation to anxiety threatens you. But our focus this morning must be the focus of the Lord. The person who looks at the Lord's word, when the Lord is saying no man can serve two masters, and yet he vigilantly shakes his feasts at God saying, I will serve two masters. If you're that kind of person, may I plead with you to realize that failure awaits you. All who try to disobey this clear statement will fail. If you try to be a slave of God and a slave of money, you will end up obeying mammon while pretending to obey God. You will ultimately be known by your fruits when your hypocrisy comes forth to the surface. So are you trying to serve God and money? If you are, please realize that you are rejecting this simple, clear, choice-demanding guidance that the Lord has given. If you reject this guidance, you are saying to Jesus, at least by your actions, the following four things. You are saying, number one, I am an exception to the rule. The Lord says, no one can serve two masters. This is a universal truth. No man, nobody is able to serve two masters. No one can. In other words, it is impossible for anyone. It is vain to attempt it because the thing cannot be done. The creator of the universe says, be assured of this. 
nobody, boy or girl, young or old, rich or poor, educated or not, can be a slave to two masters. There is something laudable in attempting the difficult. But there is something sick in attempting the impossible. It is foolish to do that. It is arranging deck seats in the Titanic while you know very well it's going down. It is a sea for our country, perhaps, the legislators sit down and they decide to outlaw the law of gravity. They say we no longer believe in it. And you agree with them and you climb the tallest skyscraper in Nairobi. And you jump. And we meet with you somewhere on the 20th floor. Celebrating how you have proven that gravity is indeed non-existent. It is just a matter of time. It is just a matter of time before such a person realizes that you cannot break God's law. You break yourself against it. And this, dear friends, is a universal truth. The God who fashioned you in your mama's womb, the God who knows the 1.3 billion individuals, each and every one of them. He knows where they are. He knows them before they were formed. Knows this. No one can be the slave of God and man. You cannot do this. Are you trying to serve God and money? Secondly. You're not just engaged in a futile exercise. You are saying, secondly, that you're okay with hating God. Is that what you're saying? He says, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Two mutually exclusive choices with the outcome of love on the one hand, or hatred, on the other, is what we have before us. Dear friend, the future active indicative here should really sober us up. He will hate. Don't think that because you currently are not seeing hatred coming forth, that you will continue to do this futile thing of trying to serve two masters without ultimately hating God. Peter is told, you will deny me. He says, though everybody else does it, I will not. Have we learned? Have we learned from this omniscient God who knows all things and who tells us, you will, you will, if you do not want to hate me, don't attempt this. If you call yourself child of God, why do you want to place yourself on a path that is going to lead you towards hating the one whom you profess to love? Is it wise to run in a train that is going on the opposite direction and assume you will not end up in the destination that that train is going towards? Are you saying that you're okay with hating the Lord, with detesting him, with disliking him, disliking him strongly? Are you saying you're okay with ultimately being hostile towards the Lord? Are you, okay? Are you saying you're okay with having an aversion for God? Because that will be the fruit of making an attempt 
to serve God. Love and hate in the Semitic usage had the implication of choice or not choosing. If you loved, you chose. If you hated, you did not choose. And are you saying that you're okay with not choosing which would mean rejecting the Lord because of earthly treasures? When we talk about love and hate, please realize it's not just emotion. Don't say, I'm not feeling hatred towards the Lord. That's not what is in view here. What's in view is a reference to decisions that ask, will you be loyal to God or loyal to earthly treasures? So that to say you're okay with hating God is to say you're okay with not being concerned about what he is concerned with. Being concerned for him. He created you for himself. And then you turn around and you say, I'm not concerned about what you are concerned for. Here, Saint, may I especially encourage you here. To perhaps plead with you is a better one. Do not be deceived. Because at the time of crisis, a person will choose what matters most to him. A traffic policeman stops you. Before they ask for a bribe, you will offer it. A decision on the education of your child comes before you. And you will make a decision that could easily take that child away from the things of God. The opportunity for marriage comes your way as you think about his unloaded fellow. Remember the joke of a wealthy spouse asking the other, would you have married me if I did not inherit this estate from my departed parents? And the person says, I would have married you regardless of where you inherited the estate from. The issue will be that ultimately you will be required to make a choice on, on whom you're going to be loyal. The allegiance that matters most at that particular point of crisis will master you and you will worship it. One will be hated and betrayed as you worship the one that you demonstrate allegiance to. Or have we forgotten Judas? Remember Judas. Remember him betraying the Lord. And for what? For 30 pieces of silver. To say that you make a choice to serve God and money is to say that you're okay with not regarding Christ with affection. You're saying, I am okay not preferring the Lord. And what are you comparing him to? You're saying you're okay with not showing the Lord love, a love that is an answer, a love that is in reciprocation to what he has already done for you. You're saying you are okay with not having a high regard for him. Are you still outlawing gravity? Are you still happy saying, I'm falling freely, I'm not bleeding. We outlawed gravity in our parliament. Please stop. Stop saying, I have so far been serving God and money. 
and I've been doing it successfully. In fact, I don't hate the Lord. I only feel love towards him. The Lord says you will hate him if you go that path. The Lord tells you that you will hate one and love the other. And as I've already said, other here reminds us that this is an impossibility because these two things are different. They are qualitatively different. If you pick one end of the stick, you will end up picking the other also. And I could wear you out with scriptures that warn us about the consequences of hating God. Let me just read to 1 Corinthians 16.22. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. And then Paul concludes, our Lord. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our minds, and with all our strength. Not because we add to God when we love him. Not because we reduce him when we don't love him because he deserves it. And a failure to love God has serious consequences. Psalm 2.12 Peace the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We've had recent Sunday schools sessions on the subject of the God who has revealed himself in Scripture as the one whose name is Jealous. And maybe it would help us to revisit those Sunday school sessions. Who among us can stand? We all hate. We all have in one way or another been ensnared. By mammon, and we deserve the wrath of God. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can even at this very moment find forgiveness of sin. We can find strength to stop hating God, to start loving Him as He should be loved. Thirdly, you say it is okay to love God and money, you're saying you're okay with despising God. The Lord says, or oh, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. What is devotion as it is used here? Devotion here would have the implication of loyalty. Taking the side of. You will take the side of one. You will hold on to one. You will cling to one. You will hold fast to one. You will adhere to one. You will pay attention to one. You will follow to join and maintain loyalty to one. That is devotion. And what about despise? As you hold on to one, despise has the implication of you will look down on the other. You will scorn or treat with contempt the other. You will disregard the other. You will have no regard. You will refuse to follow the other. You will feel, you will show contempt for the other because you think they are bad or valueless. You will treat as not important. Now we've gathered here because we want to worship the Lord. Or have you come to church because you want to be equipped on how to go out there and disregard the Lord? That's not why we are. And so let us repent and run away. We stop. That we can, that it is okay to despise the Lord. And we do not verbalize it, but by our actions in an attempt to reject this guidance, 
we act as if we are in agreement with that statement. Finally, this statement would imply that you are saying you know better than God. He is saying you cannot serve God and money. Please notice that something has changed here. There is a switch in this last, this conclusion from the use of third person statements, no one can, to second person, you. And we need to ask ourselves, why is that the case? There's a conclusion here from the first part of the verse. This switch makes us realize that to emphasize the need for us to realize that single-minded devotion is a thing that each one of us must pursue, the Lord now moves from that third person state to a single to, to a second person you. He says you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and worldly wealth, wealth or riches, possessions, treasures, even legitimate treasures which rival your loyalty to God. You cannot have a commitment to God as a slave, and commitment to materials. What are you putting your confidence in? What is your replacement Messiah? Money? Property? Trust funds? Securities? Relationships? Reputation? The focus here is on mammon. And money here is being personified as being a slave owner, a rival lord, a trusted thing that we seek to abandon ourselves into its hand for comfort, for protection. God says you cannot do it. It You must serve God or money. You cannot serve both. The interests of these two are different. They are conflicting. If your affection is towards the service of one, if you will love one, you must of necessity Hate the other. If you determine to resolutely hold to the one, then by picking that one end of the stick, you pick the other, which determines likewise to disregard and even despise the other. You cannot serve, you cannot have loyalty that is divided. It is not an option. It is especially not an option for you, disciple of the Lord. I'll conclude by saying slavery to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords requires absolute loyalty and commitment to him as your single master. It requires your total, undivided commitment. So that if you're trying to serve God and money, if you have such a divided loyalty, you're going to fail. You're riding two horses going in different directions. Or as the Swahili proverb says, you're trying to hold hands 
with somebody who is going on the opposite direction on the ladder. It does not work. Serving God must be done wholeheartedly. And therefore, we must tear our minds from worldly enticements. We must fix our attention on our Father, our Heavenly Father, our Father who is in heaven. We must ensure our hearts are not tethered to the world. This is a call for us to re-examine our priorities, to see if we are falling short, the Lord's calling upon our lives. I encourage you, if you are here and have been coming to church, we thank God that you've been coming. But if behind the scenes, what we are not seeing is an attempt to serve God and man, we plead with you, stop it. And turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or are you saying that the wages you'd receive from him are such that you'd prefer another owner? Is that what we are saying? Having looked at the realities of treasures on earth, passing away, let us serve the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our strength, with all our We cannot do this. This is beyond us. The only way this would be possible is to flee to Christ. When he takes away our hearts of stone, he gives us hearts of flesh. Hearts that delight in him, delight in the duty of worshipping him and him May the Lord be pleased to bless us and to add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Let's kindly rise up.